Thanks, Scott, for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you got it. Uh, you're the creator of Dilbert, among other things, and you blog as well, which I, and I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna check out this blog because I'll be honest, somebody uh, who's a fan of the show said, this guy's crazy, what do you think? And that's how I was, found it. Was crazy the word? Crazy was the word. That's like the best thing anybody said about me this year. <laughs> yeah, this year maybe. But it, it was late last year, so you, yeah. you, know, you were in your predictive mode. And the reason that people were saying this was because, in large part, you had said some pretty crazy-ish sounding things about the election, and you essentially predicted a Trump victory. A year in advance. A year in advance. Um, and my prediction was different than anybody else's in the sense that I had a specific reason for it that was different from other people's reason. Some people said, oh, it's his policies or it's, you know, people want to change. You know, they had lots of different reasons. I think CNN printed 24 different explanations after he won. Different pundits said, well, it was this one reason. And of course, there's never one reason. Mm -hmm. But my, uh, my theme was persuasion. So I'm a trained hypnotist. I learned hypnosis when I was in my 20s. And when I saw Trump enter the stage, I saw a level of persuasive talent that didn't look accidental. Um, he's someone who has acquired these skills over a lifetime. He wrote a book on it. You know, the, uh, the art of the deal is essentially persuasion in the, in the form of negotiating. And he talks about persuasion. He talks about it all the time. And when I saw it, I thought, I think I'm seeing something other people aren't seeing because I have a certain training. Right. You know, I've been learning persuasion for decades after I learned hypnosis specifically. And I just saw more technique, and I thought, he's bringing a, a flamethrower to a stick fight, and this isn't going to be fair. A lot of the predictions were a little spooky, or at least people thought they were spooky, especially after they became true. I guess predictions aren't spooky until they become true. Yeah. Otherwise, they're just crackpot theories. They're just crackpot. And that's the way that it came across in the beginning. So you experienced maybe a little bit of like a... What, what would you even call it? I don't want to say smugness because you're not smug, at least not so far. Well, I couldn't be smug at all until the actual election. Right. That, that was the, you know, the, the flagship uh, <laughs> prediction. If I got that wrong, the other ones didn't matter. But then the election happened, and this strange thing immediately happened, which is you saw the country sort of going insane because people didn't expect it. It was... Um, they were thinking that Hitler had just been elected, you know, the people on the other side. And it was a dangerous situation. And uh, I went on Periscope, you know, as soon as the election was uh, certain, and advised people to stay cool, you know, and don't gloat. And I, I tried to not gloat myself for the same mm -hmm. reason. They just don't need any more trouble, you know? It, I mean, it's good enough to win if, if that's what you wanted as your result. Um, didn't really need to rub it in. Um, so I, I tried to resist that. And you, you sort of, would you say live tweet, or is it live Periscope commentary? throughout the election and the debates and things like that. That must have been interesting. So I did a combination of lots of tweeting and lots of periscopes. Periscopes, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a live streaming service owned by Twitter. So I could just uh, turn on my phone at any moment, hit a couple of buttons, and I was you know, live to usually a thousand people at a time as soon as I went on. And it, uh, congrats on being one of the last people to use Periscope, I feel like. <laughs> I'm, not sure how, I'm not sure if that's even still uh, the, the king of the hill, but you're doing more YouTube stuff now? Yeah, so I'm transitioning to um, probably Facebook and YouTube. Great. We'll see you on there as well. I, I do want to say, though, a lot of people who say, well, you know, you could have predicted Hillary or you could have predicted Trump. A lot of people predicted one way or the other. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. What makes your prediction different than just you didn't pick wrong? <laughs> Yeah, so there's always going to be this survivor thing, right? It's like you say, somebody was going to be right no matter what. Right. And those people are going to say, because I'm a genius. Right, you know, that, that, naturally. And, and of course, I'm doing the same thing. Well, why wouldn't I? Because I can predict <laughs> a coin flip, and I have a 50% chance of looking like I can tell the future in that, in that case. So what I tried to do, since I, I assumed that the situation would happen, if I were right, I would be one of many people who said, hey, I was right, and here's my reason, and here's my reason. And so I tried to make a lot of subsidiary predictions along the way, you know, so that they could see that mine were being right on a fairly regular basis when other people were less right. So, for example, when um, Carly Fiorina was in the debates in the, in the primaries, and she did her big, uh, I would say her, her big move, she made a big push about abortion, and she described in vivid details things I'm not going to describe for the benefit of, of the viewers. Sure. <laughs> uh, just a horrible abortion went wrong scene. 
And I predicted at the moment, based on persuasion, not based on logic or policies or any of those things which people largely ignore, uh, I predicted that nobody wanted in their head that image any longer than they needed it. Sure. And electing her <laughs> kept it in their heads. And that was the top of her polls the day that she, uh, she was talking about that. And she dropped from 15% to 4 or 5% within a few weeks. Just because of the anchoring and the negative association? Well, that was my prediction. Based on the, such a horrible image that is now associated with her brand, she just ruined her brand accidentally. Now, uh, I make a distinction between what I call the, the 2D world and the 3D world of persuasion. In the 2D world, facts matter and policies matter and all that stuff. But I think we've seen that that's not the case, right? right? <laughs> I, I mean, it, when I was saying it a year ago, it was actually radical, and I'm pretty sure no one else was saying it, you know, a year ago. But um, if you look at any of the headlines of the past month, you're going to see a lot of people saying, "Why is it that people are so irrational? Uh, why do why do people make decisions this way? How did we get Brexit? How did we get Trump?" So the world has moved over to my point of view. Sure, this is As, like a Dan Ariely book playing out in real life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know who he is, but I'm sure that's Pre a good reference. Predictably irrational, so oh, essentially okay. that people are guided by these sets of emotions, rationalizing behavior. We can talk about that in a little bit, because I know, I know some of that in your blog as well, uh, about our feelings and emotions guiding us, but continue. Yeah, so other uh, smaller uh, predictions I made when uh, Trump started uh, going at Ben Carson, when Ben Carson pulled even or a little bit ahead of him in the primaries, uh, if you remember, probably everybody saw this video of Trump acting out the belt buckle stabbing incident from Ben Carson's own book, where, where Trump came out from behind the lectern and actually did an, a pantomime of the attack <laughs> where, where he was pretending to stab and it was hitting his belt buckle and he, he mocked it and he, he called, uh, he called uh, Ben Carson pathological because that's a word I guess Carson had used himself in his mm. own book. And I watched that performance and it was so visual that um, I thought this is going to be way more powerful than people think. And I predicted that was the end of him. And that turned out to be the high of his polls as well. Uh, because the, the visual persuasion is just so good. Uh, it's, it's sort of one of the, the kings of persuasion up there with you know, fear and identity and a few others that are a little bit higher. So if we can associate somebody with something negative, such as Carly Fiorino with a gr gross depictions of surgical procedures and abortions, can we do the opposite and create associations that are positive with people so that our polls go up in theory? Totally. I don't give dating advice, but I'll, yeah, I'll no just need. use this as, a, as an example. And a, a, um, if you were to meet somebody for the first time, whatever you say first ends up sort of sticking in their mind as their first, uh, first image of you. So one of the best things you say, hey, you know, how you doing? And the, if the first thing you say is something that takes them to a visual place, like have you had any good uh, vacations or a uh, good day for the beach? Uh, have you been to any, uh, any tropical islands? You know, as soon as you can work that in, their mind goes to their own memory of their best vacation tropical paradise and just puts them in this warm mood, and then you're standing there. Sure. So the sure. association happens, and people, people have a hard time shaking a first impression, so that lasts longer than it should. So basically, we are using their own associations and then taking one wire out of there and disconnecting it to ourselves. One of the tricks of persuasion is you want to um, directionally tell somebody to imagine a certain thing, but you don't want to overspecify. Because as soon as you overspecify, people say, oh, that wasn't what I was seeing. Right. Or, yeah, I don't have a memory of that exactly. But if you say, imagine you're in, a, you know, you're in nature or you're in the forest, people just see their own forest and then that makes them happy. Right, then they're on last month's hike through the redwoods. Yeah, right. yeah it so takes we, them back to a happy place. We, let their, we want to let their mind fill in the blanks. Yes, you, you have to be careful about it. You need to you know, bound it uh, intelligently so that when they fill it in, it still works for you. Right, otherwise we end up with the, the misuse of persuasion, which I saw this weird example of this. There's these, what's the name of this? It's like regressive hypnosis therapy where they can they basically are programming people to think they've been abducted by aliens. <laughs> they're implanting these memories by letting people go back and associate things, but they're also adding this little creative element in there that kind of right. runs away in their subconscious mind. So I have done a version of that. Um, when I was learning hypnosis, we had to practice on real people, and it was better if you charged them, because one of the things you learn in hypnosis is if somebody pays for something, they give it more credibility. Sure. 
And once they've given it credibility, you actually are a better persuader. They've actually given you that. So I would charge people to uh, regress them to their prior lives <laughs> under hypnosis. Now, I don't believe that people have prior lives, but they sure did. And they would describe these, these detailed scenarios, and they would talk in you know, sort of the voice of the person. But uh, you know, at the time I was doing it, this was a long time ago, I was uh, a young man. And I, at the time I was thinking, well, I'm open to the possibility that there are prior lives. You know, I haven't seen anything that rules it out, right? But after I was done with this, I definitely didn't believe, because all these people had exquisite detailed memories that had a weird coincidence. None of them were Chinese. You know, a quarter, oh, right. a, a quarter of the world is Chinese. Somebody out of 20 people is going to be Chinese in a prior life, you know? So, but none of them were. Uh, and they were all things that you would see on movies. You know, sure. It was sort of like, a, uh, I'm Cleopatra, you know, or I'm a, I'm a Viking, you know, right out of HBO, basically. I notice that people, whenever they tell me about their quote-unquote past lives, and I, I tend to limit my contact with people who tell me these types <laughs> of things, but I notice no one's ever like, yeah, I was just a farmer, and before that I was a farmer, and before that I was a farmer, and before that I shoveled donkey poop into a furnace. It's always, I was a warrior, I was the, yeah. you know, the king's hand. Yeah. And I don't know, statistically speaking, you're much more likely to have just been a stillborn baby or something like <laughs> yeah, that. I mean, pardon, pardon the, the crude uh, reference here, yeah. but you're much more likely to be some homeless guy who got hit by a, a horse cart and died young. Yeah, you go back 100 years. And yeah. there, there weren't too many happy people. No, you know? no, and you're right. Most of, most, most of us would have been Chinese and or, you know, if we go back far enough, everybody would have been African. But no, we're royalty from Egypt. But, but even when they have course. bad lives, they're always soldiers. Yeah, I noticed right. that. I know like, with men anyway. Right. Right. It's always soldiers. Yes, soldiers who died bravely in battle. And very few people, I don't know if anybody was a different gender. Oh, that's interesting. So. Yeah. Well, you could do a prolonged study on that if you yeah. had all the time in the world. Uh, maybe in your next life you can do that. <laughs> You mentioned that Trump is a master persuader, that he's a hypnotist. And when you write master persuader on your blog, you're capitalizing master persuader. Is there a reason that you do that? Is that just a term that you've coined? Or are you? Oh, it's to call it out uh, so that people can see it's a sort of a, a term that I'm trying to popularize, at least for Trump in particular. Um, so no other reason. And you mentioned some specific examples, such as uh, the Rosie O'Donnell comment and things like that. Can you explain that? Yeah, so the first moment when I thought to myself, oh my goodness, he's going to win, uh, and I noticed his skill, was during the first debate uh, in which uh, Megyn Kelly had set a trap for him. She had a question about his past uh, crude comments about women, which if you imagine this happening to any other candidate up there, just being asked and, and quoted back your own just horrible quotes, it's just a death trap. He should have been done on the first debate in the first minute. That should have been the end of it. And that's what I sort of expected uh, at that moment. And she start, starts bringing up the comments he's made about women, and then he just sort of semi-interrupts her, and he says, only Rosie O'Donnell. The whole place goes nuts, and you know, we remember the answer, but we've already forgotten the question. Right, he made sure. the answer so much more interesting than the question, and by the way, it wasn't even an answer to the question. Sure. It was just something he said that was sort of related. Um, now, what's beautiful about that is that Rosie O'Donnell is a character that the Republican base, the people who cared about the primaries, have a strong feeling about. So he immediately got emotion on his side. He was against her, then they must be on his side, right? Because they're against her. Uh, but she's also visual. Everybody knows who she oh, is. Oh, yeah. And so you imagine her, right? So this will be a theme you'll probably hear a few more times in our time together. As soon as you can make something visual, you're, you're already the king of the senses, right? So what, uh, what Megyn Kelly had were a bunch of words that we don't have a person to put to. Uh, you know, it's just sort of it's this. It's an abstract concept. Abstract. And then he, he just moved that off the page with this perfect visual, emotional, you know, attracting reference. And I literally stood up and I just said, okay, that's not normal. Right. That, that's the best you've ever seen. Anybody handle any question, that was a hard question of all time, probably. Because if you get that cannon aimed at you from Megyn Kelly, and you start going, well, you know, I meant it in this context, and this con this other thing is taken out of context, you're just digging. You're just continually digging a nice little grave for yourself Nothing you with these do. words lining the sides. But instead, he took the cannon and he twisted the barrel around and basically right. aims it at Rosie O'Donnell, a common target for his own base. 
right. and everybody just goes ro roaring with laughter, and they forget about everything that came before that because he managed to just dodge that. And then entirely. he used it as his uh, platform to talk about political correctness. Uh, and I have to admit, when I first heard him talk about that, I thought, well, people have been talking about political correctness forever, and it's never really gotten any kind of purchase. But he made it such a brand mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that, that you, you sort of almost wanted it and expected it. If you were a Trump supporter, you, you, you just wanted him to be politically incorrect. It was just more fun after a while. What's going on with his, his uh, he likes to uh, obviously attack the media, but he does it in a way that's not just well, this journalist, this, this, that, and the other thing. He really does aim specifically at credibility targets. So he'll say something like, check your facts, and then he'll name the person. Check your facts. So now you're associating, in a way, that person with, well, they don't do their homework, <laughs> even if it's completely unfounded. By the way, I have adopted that very phrase, the check your facts thing, because uh, on Twitter, often people will say, hey, you said blah, 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 and it'll be just something I didn't say or anything. I used to try to correct it. Right. And that, like you, what we said earlier, as soon as you start explaining, somebody immediately says, ah, you're backpedaling. Mm -hmm. You can't win. I'm not backpedaling. I'm just explaining what you got wrong. So instead, I say, check your facts. <laughs> and it just ends this, the conversation just so perfectly. Because so. all they can say is, I did, and you still said that. But by then, you're calling on someone else, or there's another part of the yeah, but conversation. Yeah, life has moved on. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and the same thing with fake news. It's constantly saying, fake news, fake news. Is this just a matter of say it enough times and people start to believe it? What's going on there? Well, first of all, it was, uh, I believe he flipped around the attack, which you see him do. So the fake news was really aimed at the Republican side with their literally fake news where somebody just made up stories. Right. When he's talking about it, a little more often it's um, something out of context, uh, that sort of thing. It still ends up being fake because if you leave the context out, it's, it's the wrong message. Um, and I think he does it strategically, and he does it uh, to lower the credibility of the, I would call them the opposition media, because they're, they're definitely not there to help him. No, that's definitely true, and I think they're also pretty pissed that he's treating them the way that he's treating them, and they're pissed that he won in the first place, which is understandable from their perspective. Why not just go with Occam's razor on some of this Trump stuff, whereas people say, well, look, if you think about it this way and you look at it that way, then it's really skilled and it's really clever. What about the Occam's razor explanation, which is, nah, he's just a jackass? <laughs> um, that wouldn't explain his consistent success all the way through. Uh, he went from, you know, nothing with no experience um, to president of the United States. Uh, you don't do that by being a jackass that just is fun to watch on TV. Firing at uh, ready, yeah. fire, aim type situation. Yeah, there, there are just too many things that he did right. I mean, it, it, if you even look at the things that people say he did wrong, you know, the, the chaos and the whatever, if you look at the people he fired and when he did it, um, first he had, uh, uh, it was uh, Corey, right? Corey Lewandowski. And uh, Corey had some issues with, you know, touching an elbow of a woman in public or something. And um, he wasn't exactly the right person for the next phase of the, you know, the nomination and, and securing the nomination. So he got rid of, he fired his friend <laughs> who got him that far and did <laughs> probably an amazing job for that phase. He was the right person. He was a you know, scrappy street fighter kind of personality. Then he got Paul Manafort, who was you know, the smooth operator, got him through the uh, convention. And, uh, and then he went uh, with Kellyanne Conway to, to close it. So a lot of the stuff that looks like, you know, what's wrong with him, he can't keep his staff together, or whatever, whatever criticisms people are making, they all seem to work. Like, you, you can very easily find the business reason that any of this happened. You know, I'm not saying they didn't make mistakes, because it's a long, long process, they do a lot of stuff. He made his share, but the, the mistakes tended to be fairly trivial in the long run. What do you think will happen with this Jeff Sessions mess? <laughs> Too early to tell. Too early to yeah, tell? We, we, we just need to know more about that. Yeah, I was trying to nail you down to a prediction here, and then we could look at it again in a few months. Well, you can't make a prediction if it's based on facts that you know are coming tomorrow that you don't know. I know. Right? I'm, so I'm just basically trying to get you to paint yourself into a corner in a that. friendly way, of course, <laughs> uh, as a guest here on the show. What you mentioned with Trump and the blog as well, and we'll, of course, link to that in the show notes, you mentioned a concept called pacing and leading. And this is familiar to me from my hypnosis NLP stuff that I took a million years ago that I did not really keep certification on. 
tell me what's going on here. Tell us what's going on here. What is pacing and leading, and ideally, how can we maybe take a page out of that manual? So pacing and leading is the most fundamental uh, hypnosis technique. Right? There are lots of techniques that you have to layer together to get a result. But pacing and leading means that first you match your subject in some way. For example, I'm matching you right now. Right, that, was that an accident? Did you do that or did I do that? No, you did that okay. be, uh, because I paced you earlier, but that's, that's <laughs> another story. Uh, so you match somebody either physically or the, the style of their talking. It could be emotionally you're matching them. So you're matching them in some way that they recognize as, hey, you're one of me. Because people um, are not really that rational. If you act like them, you talk like them. Yeah, it must be a family member. You know, I don't mean literally, but in some part mm -hmm. of you, some part of your brain, you just have an automatic trust for somebody who's doing whatever you're doing at the same time. So Trump does this um, with emotion, uh, meaning that all the things that he says that are just wrong, like factually wrong, they mm -hmm. don't pass the, the, the fact checking, and we all know there are lots of them, right? Whether you're a supporter or anti-Trump, there are a lot of things that didn't pass the fact check. But if you look at all of them, they're all directionally, emotionally correct. Meaning that if he said, you know, blah, 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 terrorism is bad for 10 different reasons that aren't exactly true, the people who have the same fear of terrorism said, yeah, he's sort of where I am, emotionally. The facts really didn't matter that much. But he, he agreed with you, and he agreed with you more than you agreed with yourself. <laughs> if you were a little bit afraid of terrorism, he was a lot afraid. So, so he sort of paced everybody in their, their emotional state. So Once he had that, the second part, people trust him and then he can lead, and he's obviously doing that now. So if you watch the number of uh, things which he said he was gonna do in the primaries, and you see sort of a softening and moving to the middle, and you see very little complaint from the, the far right, the people who you would expect to complain. And the reason is, he brought them a victory, he brought them a unified Congress, he emotionally agreed with them on every issue, from abortion to terrorism to jobs to immigration. And that was enough. So that gave him uh, the credibility to lead. When you say pacing and, and leading in the concept, or the context, I should say, of, well, I paced you earlier, uh, are we talking about mirroring body language and things like that? Because I feel like I do a lot of that as a habit. I learned it back in law school because it works. Right. Um, but it's, it can be really clunky when people are starting to apply this when they're new. So, for example, I notice when I have people on the show that they'll often do exactly what I'm doing or face me in a certain way. And I do that deliberately to make people comfortable most of the time. I don't really care about how they sit. I just want them to feel good. Uh, but I do find it that it's very hard to resist that because you actually want to create comfort physically with somebody if you have rapport with them. And of course, if you don't, then it becomes a whole different ball game as I cross <laughs> my leg, right? right. Um, is this something you do consciously now? Or is this something that is so autopilot for you that it just happens? Um, the pacing is conscious, but it's also, you know, the details of it are somewhat automatic. It's like anything you learn. It just becomes part of you. It's not something you, you think to apply. But if I'm meeting a new person, I'm very much thinking, what, you know, how can I make this a good, good situation? And I think that people who have high emotional intelligence tend to do at least some elements of this almost automatically. Would you agree with that? Well, I, uh, maybe, but I'm not sure what the correlation is. I'm not sure if there's a causation there. I think it's because people with high EQ often are trying to gain rapport with other people, and one of oh, the, a great okay. way to do that is typically to pace and lead, or at least to pace. That would make sense. Yeah. yeah. That would be a, a good tool. And so this just happens for you automatically in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, I'm always looking for the way to match somebody and, uh, when I first meet them. What elements are there of matching? Body language, are you talking about verbal and nonverbal communication, eye contact? Yeah, it's everything. So it's from the physical to the emotional to the, the specific way you word things. The best example is, there, uh, this is straight from NLP hypnosis mm -hmm. training. If somebody uses, uh, let's say, a lot of war analogies, like, oh, I jumped on the hand grenade, we have to take that hill, um, you know, if, any number of war analogies, if you also do that, they will feel more comfortable with you. They won't know why. They'll just think, yeah, this, this is a good guy. Can you ever go overboard with it? And I'll, I'll ask you this in the context of this example. When I was in college and I started learning this stuff, I started to do it with everybody a lot. <laughs> and uh, what would happen was if I were drinking, which I don't do that much of anymore, 
I would get into a cab with, say, a driver from Samoa. And towards the end of the ride, my girlfriend, after we got out of the car, would go, okay, did you do that on purpose? And I would say, what are you talking about? And my friends are all in the back with my girlfriend, and they go, we thought that guy was going to get mad. You, you talked with the same accent as him, same cadence. We thought you were imitating him. And, you know, just because my calibration was so far off because I'd had four beers or something like that. Right. But the person never noticed. The person never noticed. I w if you hadn't said that, that's the very next thing that was going to come out of my, mi uh, my mouth, uh, is that you can pace people in the most obvious ways, and they do not notice. In fact, for practice, we used to, uh, I was working my day job in a, you know, a big uh, corporation at the time, and they would tell us to sit across from somebody in a meeting and, and you know, do the, uh, the pacing, where if they're like this, you do right, this. Right, the exact, the clunky, this, this. precise mirroring right. of body and, language. And then you change, and then you do this, and you watch them, you watch them do this just immediately. It's the uh, it's same process as a yawn, you know, a yawn makes everybody yawn. Why does that happen? Do you know why that's contagious? I've read about it, but there's a reason, right? I think there's an there actual is, reason. I, just, I actually don't know. I wasn't testing your knowledge. I actually don't know. I remember I, at the Art of Charm, our live programs, we teach a lot of special forces and intelligence guys. And one of the tricks that I'd found a long time ago, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to come up with this, was if uh, it's a counter-surveillance technique where if you're sitting down and you think, is this person paying undue attention to me? If you can get a very real yawn going, which you often can by tweaking with your jaw, right. and you see them yawn, it's not a guarantee because often people are seeing us out of their peripheral vision and it has nothing to do with their focus. But if you can do it a few times and they do it each time, you start to get yeah. the feeling that that guy right there is not reading because every time I yawn, he's yawning and it's so involuntary. And if you get really good, you can see their jaw muscles tighten when they try to hold that yawn in. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's been pretty effective for some sort, at, at least in some scenarios, or it's just a good gimmicky thing to teach, but uh, we've had good results with things like that. So I love your example of, of watching the jaw tighten. Like you're talking about a little. Yeah, little, the little, little uh, right man, is it mandible, mandibula? I can't remember Let's the name. Let's say it is. Something like Let's that. Let's say it is. Um, yeah, so one of the things you learn from hypnosis, and, and apparently uh, you learn the same stuff, is a detailed uh, observation, uh, looking for very small changes in skin tone, muscle tone, you know, posture, and all those things. And. Uh, I know she's, you sat up straight I just did I that. I, this chair for me is, uh, and I don't know how it is for you, but for me, this chair kind of constantly makes me feel like I'm just slowly hunching into a little <laughs> I was having ball. the same feeling, yes. So I, I tend to straighten up. But now, of course, I'm self-conscious about it because I'm like, you didn't pace me. This is just the chair. <laughs> it's just the chair. It's just the damn chair. <laughs> that's what you, that's uh, what my rationalization is thinking, right? I'm, I have to justify my behavior because my conscious mind doesn't know I'm doing That's right. Uh, but I was going to ask you, uh, my observation after learning these skills is that you can detect lying really easily. Really? Now, have you found that in your own life that, that you're the one in the room who can tell some, if somebody's lying? It depends, actually. I would say I probably should be better at it than I am, but I tend to, in many ways, overthink that situation. When I finally get my conscious mind out of the equation as much as possible, then I'm much better at it. Uh, let me give it a demonstration for your, your listeners of, of a liar, lie versus the truth. So ask me twice, um, are you the murderer? And I'll give you two different answers and see which one is obviously the lie. So ask me if I'm the murderer. Are you the murderer? Where do you get that information? Who told you I'm a murderer? Right, now ask me again. Are you the murderer? What the hell are you talking about? Right. No, I'm not a murderer. I don't even know what you're talking about. Which one of those was the lie? Well, this is all dependent <laughs> on whether or not you've actually killed someone. Yeah, right. So guess, let's assume you true. haven't. I would say the, the second is the most authentic, more immediate reaction. Yeah, so the, the person who says, what is your evidence, is always the liar. Because if you have good evidence, then maybe they have to confess, and they better just do it in the best possible way, or just start running. And, <laughs> if, you, and if you don't have good evidence, maybe you just got a lucky guess, and they can stick with their lie. So the liar always asks, the, asks you about the source of your evidence. The person who didn't murder anybody doesn't need to ask because there was no evidence. Right. They, or they assume the justice system will prove me innocent because that works every time. <laughs> that works every time. Uh, I think that uh, there's, 
there's a lot of truth to that. I'm sure some people are better liars than others. We know the body's really, it's tough to get your body to lie in concert with your mouth. Right. People who do that well win awards on stages in front of millions of people. Right. Um, my old boss who taught interrogation to police and military gave me a really good trick, which was if you ask somebody who's guilty what should happen to the person who gets caught perpetrating a particular crime, they usually start rationalizing. Well, you know, it depends how how badly was the person beaten up? You know, because if they just got their stuff stolen and they weren't hurt, then maybe we're a little more lenient. Whereas the normal innocent person just goes, I don't care, hang them, shoot them. I don't give a crap because it has nothing to do with them <laughs> and they know it. So their emotional reaction is total indifference or super harsh punishment because they're not that kind of person. Can you imagine being that, that guy's kid? Yeah. Like, it would just be terrible. Yeah. It, would, it would be tough. He was a parent. Yeah. So we'll, I, have, I have to get back in touch and see how his now teenage kids are doing or if they're if they've since been <laughs> locked in the basement for life. Uh, so pacing and leading involves matching people, creating a bond with them. Can you give us some examples of Trump doing this in things that we've seen or will be able to see on YouTube? Yeah, primarily the emotional stuff. So he goes hard on the immigration thing because people are afraid, hard on terrorism because people are afraid of that. But he'll also quickly change if he, if he needs to, if he's made a mistake. Like uh, he, he said something about uh, abortion, maybe should be a penalty for the, the woman who seeks an illegal abortion. <laughs> and, you know, if you didn't know anything about politics, and he was new to it, right? It was almost reasonable because he was just thinking, well, people who commit crimes, they should be punished. But it turns out that is a special case in which it just makes more sense that the doctor is the, the only one you punish. Sure. So, so he'll sometimes change. But when you see him uh, with his extreme you know, anchor, I call it, his extreme emotional anchor, he's getting everybody to not only imagine the extreme so that when he moves to the middle, it doesn't look so extreme. He does that all the time. And he talks about it. He says, I do that. Um, but it's also emotionally bonding with people. So really, every one of his, um, every one of his policies has an emotional hook to it. How is it different from just flip-flopping, right? Because if he's pushing us in one direction and then goes, actually, just kidding, we're going to go over here, if it's not somebody who's a master persuader or a, hy a hypnosis-trained person, it just looks like they're changing their mind because it's convenient. Um, maybe there's an example that I can't think of, but with Trump, I've only seen him on the far end of the spectrum and just sort of move in the spectrum. I've, I've never seen him go to the other side. Is there an example of that? Uh, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't should have come armed with one. I think I was mostly looking at things like the wall. Well, maybe we'll do a fence. No, we're going to have a wall now. I mean, it just keeps constantly Well, let's talk around. about that. I love This is one of my favorite examples, the wall. So when he first started saying wall, 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 everybody said, it can't be a solid wall the entire way, maybe some fences and drones and water hazards and, and whatever. And at one point, he... Sounds like a mini golf course. Yeah. <laughs> and at one point, he said that, oh, yeah, it might be different solutions in different places. But he rapidly and wisely went back to the incorrect statement that it's going to be a wall. And here's why. The incorrect statement makes you talk about it all the time. And the stuff you focus on just becomes more important to you because it's the only thing you've been talking about. So this whole wall thing, the whole immigration thing, before he ran, I didn't even know it was a, a big issue. I thought it was an issue, but not really the biggest one. But now it feels like it's the biggest issue just because he made it so. It's so important in our minds. But the wall, when he says it's a wall, it's a big, beautiful wall. It's a great have a door. wall, if you will. Yeah, and it'll have a door. <laughs> You can picture it, sure. but he didn't give you so many details that you can't picture the wall you want to see. So everybody's seeing the wall they want to see. It's inc incredibly visual. Compare that to, well, we need border security in a variety of ways. Each section will have its own solution that matches the Gl section. And our eyes are glazing over. Concept, concept, right. where's, where's my picture? Give me a picture. Trump gives you a picture every time. Sure. And he does it at the cost of being wrong. Meaning it's not going to be a solid wall the whole way. He said it won't. Everybody says it won't. That's 100% true, but he still says it's true. And it's the wrongness that actually keeps you thinking about it. And ah, it's, not a, it's not a solid wall. And of course, the term great wall is just a hat tip to <laughs> the big wall that everybody knows and has known since they were a kid. Right, and right? you know, contrast is always an important thing, right? So if you can you know, get the right contrast, you can sell anything. So people are saying, we can't possibly build a wall. But if he calls it the Great Wall, and you think of the Great Wall of China, well, they were doing that stuff with, you know, I don't know, did they have the wheel yet when they built, the, <laughs> when they yeah, built that? I, I would hope so, because I've <laughs> been there, and it's amazing. But they were sticking these rocks together with 
I believe, rice gruel, and it's still there. I mean, the dang thing's still there. It's incredible. There are buildings in San Francisco that haven't been around nearly as long that are in worse states of repair than the Great Wall of China in certain places. Yeah, so it's a, good, it's a good thing to pair yourself with if people are wondering if we have the wherewithal to build a wall. Yeah, we can build a wall. We just have to make it a priority if we care. Sure. On the blog, speaking of the Great Wall of China and the Great Wall of Mexico slash Santa Fe or El Paso or whatever we're going to call it here, you write in the blog, there may be an objective reality in our world, but our brains did not evolve to be able to see it. This is fascinating. Can you tell me about this? Yeah. So this is not based on science. It's based on sort of a commonsensical look at things. Evolution doesn't care about your feelings. It doesn't, doesn't care about the details. It doesn't care what shirt you're wearing. It just cares if you create more of you. Right? So winning, in an evolutionary sense, is just being able to make more of you than other animals are making more of them. Um, there's no part of that that required us to be right all the time, <laughs> or even much of the time. All we need is a consistent view of the world that fits. So the example I like to use is that if you believed you were reincarnated from a Tibetan monk, and I believe that my prophet flew to heaven on a, on a horse, we're not living in the same reality, but we can both go to the grocery store, both buy our groceries, have a conversation, go out for a drink, None of it matters. So it turns out you can have entire weird fantasies in your head that usually don't matter. Um, if you look at the country now, right after the election, uh, it immediately causes cognitive dissonance, uh, the people who lost. Uh, and they started thinking that they were literally living in, a, uh, in 1930s Germany and that Hitler had just been elected. And this is real. I mean, they were actually living in this, this hallucination that the world had fallen apart and this was the worst thing. The people who won just thought, hey, we got some policies we like. Right, finally. Right? Yeah. But we, we share the same highways. We, we're, we're all living. We can all reproduce. It just didn't matter this, that at least, you know, at least one side was completely wrong. <laughs> right. You know, it didn't sure. matter. I've seen a lot of the, the fear recently. I think everybody has, unless you live in a in the middle of the desert somewhere, or maybe especially if you live in the middle of the desert somewhere. But it does seem that every election cycle, if I look back at really old writing, it's hard to find this stuff. But if you look, you find that when Obama was elected, oh my God, it's the Antichrist. Yeah. When, before that, when Bush was elected, this is going to be a police state. It's the same fatalistic crap. It just has a slightly different meme, a different right. picture. Or now people are talking about it on Snapchat, whereas before they were talking about it on Usenet which nobody knows what the hell that is anymore. I, I remember, I think it was you know, three years into the Obama presidency, and I was talking with a, an older gentleman, and he mentioned that uh, Obama was a Muslim. And I, I said, no, you don't really mean, do you think he's actually a practicing Muslim? And he said, yeah, it's well known. He's, a, he's actually a Muslim. And I had to you know, go to the internet and show him that wasn't true. But <laughs> And you were able to prove to this person from the internet that that was not the case? I don't know if he changed his mind <laughs> in the long sure. run. He probably I'm pretty went sure you're pissing and, into the wind. Yeah, time. that may have been a waste of time. Um, but the point is, his world of living in, a, in, in what looked like a you know, caliphate forming in the United States it was just pure fantasy. But it didn't stop him from reproducing or anything else. So essentially, all we need is a model that's loosely tied to a few pillars somewhere on the shoreline. Other than that, we can bounce around all we want in between the, those constraints yeah. and we'll survive just and, fine. And you, you see it all the time when uh, people go on uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Somebody will have one personality and one way of looking at the world and either they're afraid or whatever it is. You give them the drug, you check back in a week, the drug works. They have a different personality and the world is different to them. The whole world looks different. Like all the things, all the cause and effect looks different. I mean, it's completely upside down but they can still function better, actually, because if the drug worked. So yeah, we don't really need any kind of sense of actual reality in order to survive. It just was never necessary. We didn't evolve to have it. And so we're essentially run by social programming, cultural programming, and our emotional filters as to how we perceive cause and effect, and then beyond that? Well, a lot of variables bumping yeah. us around, but yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, also at the bottom of your blog post, every post, says, you might enjoy reading my book, either because you vote or you don't, or you might like reading my book because kittens are so cute. Is this the copy machine effect where you just use the word because and then everything after that is irrelevant? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the copy ma machine effect, you're referring to Robert Cialdini's book, right. Influence, in which uh, he talks about when you use the word because, 
it almost doesn't matter what you say after because people register it as a reason. And if you had a reason, well, I guess I'll give you what you want. You had a reason. Uh, so yes, I, I actually have been using nonsense reasons because I talk about that effect in my blog. So the people who get there know exactly what I'm doing. So it's both funny to them because they see it in context, but it also works. People, people have been uh, telling me that, damn it, that actually worked. I bought sure. your book because of that. I, when I tested that, because I like to test things that I hear about on the show. Otherwise, it's just another podcast slash right. YouTube channel where people say things that are, have zero basis <laughs> and everyone goes, ooh, that's amazing, and then never does anything with it. So I tested the copy machine effect and it's disturbing how effective this thing really is. I did it in the exact same context. Well, sounds cop coffee machine or copy machine. I went to right. Chipotle, which is the modern day coffee shop, Kinkos, whatever. Hi, can I cut in front of you because I have a scooter? I literally just had a, you know, a man, a manly razor scooter with me. And pe oh, sure. And very few people go. Why would that affect the need for you to get in? I think one person was went. What does the scooter have anything to do with it? And I just went. Oh, I'm just kidding. And then he went. What are you talking? What, I'm trying to figure out, you can go ahead of me, I just wonder why the scooter has anything to do with it. So it still it worked. It still worked. It yeah. still worked even though the, the guy went, scooter, right? And I, I picked dumber and dumber reasons that were more arbitrary and I even tested not picking a reason until it came out of my mouth, which forces ridiculous things to, to come to light, to come so, to the surface. So, so uh, one of the ways that I use that, even before I'd read about it in the book, is uh, you, you always have this awkward situation about who picks up the check. Sure. So, especially if you're a guy, you know, there's a little, little more social pressure. And so I'll have these situations where, you know, you go to dinner and you're thinking, okay, in this situation, uh, it's sort of a tie. I could pick up the check, the other person could. But like, sometimes you want to be the one who picks it up because it's better to be the one who does than the one who didn't. Yes. If, if it's sort of a tie, Definitely. you know, just feel a little better. And so here's the way I always win the tie. Um, I will come up with a fake because before, before dinner, it'll be something like this. Uh, I'll pay because you drove. Or I'll pay because it's your birthday. Or I'll pay because um, you had a bad day. I'll pay because you had a success in that contract that we were just talking about. Mm. And it doesn't matter what you say after the word because, People go, oh, thank you, and they'll put their wallet away. Sure. <laughs> but if you don't say that, if you say, let me get it, you'll be there now all day. Now it's a conflict. Right. Like, oh. right. Yeah. The only time, the only thing that wouldn't work would probably be some sort of negative connotation, like, I'll pay because I heard your business is doing terribly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear I'll pay because I heard your book <laughs> is not doing so well. I hear you. I hear you're a cheap bastard. Let me get <laughs> yeah. this. Nobody <laughs> likes you. Um, I I love. I'll pay for this one, you get the next one, because oftentimes it's somebody that you're, maybe you're not gonna see for a long time, you're not gonna remember this, and sure. nor should you try, don't yeah. be the, remember when I paid last time and said you get the next one? You're up, buddy. But I do, I love the, the copy machine effect, the because technique, if we can coin that. Right. It's so representative of what our minds do, which is just kind of accept any reason given to justify the previous request, and this is almost universally applicable. Yeah, that, that one and the McGurk effect, you may be familiar with that, or if no. not, I'll, I'll tell you about it, are the two things that are simplest to explain with the most profound, like changes your life forever. So the McGurk effect, if I'm saying it right, uh, is the observation that, um, I'll just tell you what the experiment was. So they, they have somebody just say the words, ba, 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 B-A-H, like a, like a sheep and they just show the, the lips going ba, ba, ba. Then they keep that tape on, the same words, ba, 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 except they do a close up of the same person's lip, except he's forming the letters that would have said fa, 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 fa. You, your brain instantly translates ba to fa in real time while you know it's a trick, while you know that the word is ba, they tell you. And, and, and all it is is the visual uh, completely changes your, your sensation to a whole a hallucination. And it's instant. And you can go back and forth as many times as you want. Between, as long as you're showing the lips uh, going fa, 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 you'll hear fa even though that's not what it is. And when you see that, you can't unsee that. How quickly the brain is reprogrammed and fooled, even when you know what the trick is, 
Every part of the trick. There's nothing about the trick you don't understand, and it immediately works. Why does this work? Because it would make sense to me if we learned speech by reading people's lips and talking, but blind people learn how to speak fine all I, the time. I, I'll tell you why it works. is because the visual persuasion just is so powerful. It overpowers yeah. the, the auditory persuasion. Yeah, if there's one thing that people could take away from this whole thing, is that if you're describing things in a visual way and someone isn't, you're going to win. It, it's just that powerful. Wow. That's a, that's a really good takeaway. The McGurk effect? Yeah, I think it's... We'll have to M Google that and throw it in the show notes. It, yeah, okay. it, it, McGurk doesn't sound that easy to spell, unless it's just like it sounds. M-C-G-U-R-K, maybe? Hopefully. Otherwise, yes. Google will tell us. Or Gork Google or knows all. Uh, you mentioned also in the news that, or in your blog, in the news, that Google is trying to dehypnotize potential ISIS recruits by manipulating what content they see when they try to search for pro-ISIS stuff. Have you been following this at all recently? Well, I, I suspect there's a lot going on in that regard, um, both in and outside the government. Uh, so yeah, I would imagine that the government has contacted the search engines to, to serve up the kinds of things that would, uh, would help the national security. Uh, I don't have any details on that. Um, at one point, I, I did have sort of a connection into that world, but I didn't really follow up on it. Um, I, I think that having a master persuader Trump in the White House is probably the only way ISIS could be defeated. Because if you think about it, war itself and killing people is just persuasion. Like you're, not really, you're not trying to kill every single person on the other side. You're trying to kill enough of them to persuade the others to stop fighting. Right. Right? So war is persuasion. Trump just has another weapon that isn't just a you know, military. He can frame things differently. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot happening in that regard. Well, you might not never, you, you may never know it happened, but I think you'll see it. Take, for example, uh, Trump's idea of the safe zones in Syria. That's, on the surface, it's just a way to keep people safe and separate the bad guys from the good people. But it's really persuasion. Because think what's going to happen when all the fighters are on one side and the women and children have been filtered out to the safe spaces and they can't get to them. What are you fighting for when all the women are gone? All right, just think about that. Yeah, from, sure. from a persuasion perspective, they've, they've still got all the weapons, they've got all the anger, they've got all the re religious reasons, but all the women are gone, or, or enough of them are gone that you know, the average person has no access to mating. When you take it down to mating, you know, now you can't mate. I think that's pretty powerful persuasion. I think you throw your gun away at that point. Yeah, all you got is just the sweaty guy next to you that's also hungry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's not get into that. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole other can of worms. That might be persuasive enough for some folks. Uh, you do mention that Google, Facebook, the internet, things like that are already kind of taking our political choices and even our free will away. I would love to hear more about that in the context of persuasion and things like that because it does seem, and we have seen that things like Facebook, even when they're not trying to be biased, the algorithm still filters for things that we click like on, which are things that we agree with and shows us more of that. So we can end up segregating ourselves into these little bubbles, which inform our political choices as well, which is why everybody who voted for Trump thinks the whole country must have voted for this guy. And everybody who yeah. voted for Hillary thinks, who in the heck voted for this guy? How did this even happen? Yeah. Because of what they're seeing in large part in the media and especially social media. Yeah, I've been testing that with some of my liberal friends who will you know, love to send emails to criticize what's happening or what was happening. And I just simply ask them, are you familiar with, say, Project Veritas or anything that is well known on the right? You know, have you even heard it? Forget about whether you agree with it. Forget about whether you think it's pertinent. Have you even heard it? And it's shocking that things that I think are just common knowledge are only common knowledge on one side. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, the same blindness works both ways. It's not a one-way thing. But it's, it certainly tells you that uh, reason, if it ever had a role, it's certainly less now. <laughs> sure. I, and I think it's becoming easier and easier because our brains do look for facts to back up our existing beliefs. That's not new to anybody who's been right. watching or listening to The Art of Charm for any period of time. However, now it's so much easier to find facts that fit our narrative when we're essentially training computers to then train us that those facts are so easy to access that they show up everywhere, whether we want them to or not. By the way, there's something way bigger than just influencing politics going on. And it goes down, comes down to the, the nature of the human being. Um, free will 
in my view of the world, is nothing but an illusion. Uh, our brains are uh, subject to the rules of you know, cause and effect and the rules of physics. So you know, a certain number of inputs for a certain condition at a certain time is only going to give you one output. We have an illusion that we're deciding things, but science has also done a pretty good job of showing that that's not the case. In fact, our rational faculties don't even fire until we've done things in some cases. That's a recent discovery, is it not? There was, I was reading a lot of news about this in the past couple. Now we're both straightening up yeah. these damn chairs. <laughs> or you're very persuasive. Uh, I went first. I'm just that's, No, I know. You did. That's why I had to call it out because I'm like, dang, that looks more comfortable. Oh, but now everyone's going to think I did it because of you. <laughs> um, we've seen a lot of brain science recently where they're actually able through, I think, fMRI to find that they can predict within a few milliseconds or seconds before somebody does something that their brain had already decided subconsciously to take that action. I first heard that in a hypnosis class. I heard that the science had already discovered that in hypnosis class in the, the 80s. Maybe now they just have more proof that that's the case? I think they have better, yeah, because of the better imaging and stuff like that. So um, it wasn't new to me, but it's certainly getting more more attention. Well, we know, and th again, things we teach at the Art of Trump all the time, rationalization of behavior is kind of the cornerstone of persuasion influence. Talking with Robert Cialdini on this show before, anytime you can get someone to take an action first, you can change their belief. Even if the action is seemingly unrelated to the belief, you can get people to then wrap their beliefs around that action nicely. I mean, if you can get, and this is for good or bad, if you can get someone to go to the gym, even if it's just to pick up a power bar for a snack for me, you can get them to work out that much more easily the next time they walk in there. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things that our brains will do because, as you mentioned, we're evolved to simply wrap ourselves into that bubble. But now, but now let, me, uh, let me complete this thought, all right? Mm -hmm. So right now, people are uh, programming computers and software, and then those things are programming humans. So your Fitbit, your your search engines and all that. Um, so it still seems like humans are affecting other humans, they're just using this tool in between. But we're very close to the point where the, the machines will make those decisions themselves. So imagine, and this is not science fiction very far away, imagine you've got a few more sensors on your body, you know, just normal stuff that we could already do, and the machine says, hey, you're a little dehydrated, take a drink. Well, the first few times it does that, you're going to say, well, I might, I might not. It's inconvenient. I don't want to walk over there. But as you continue to follow the, direct, the suggestions of the machines, you'll find they work because they're all based on science. Sure. They've, they've studied. The, they know you need this. Eventually, it won't, be, it won't be a choice anymore. On some level, you could force yourself not to have the drink. But it would require but, a lot of willpower. But why would you hurt yourself? Sure. So your free will is going to be basically, the illusion is going to disappear, I think in our lifetime, that we will actually feel like we're just sort of going along with the plan because the machines are telling us what to do and where to go and when to do it, and we're just sort of doing it. Do you have a problem with that type of guidance and persuasion? Because just to bring back the comment you made earlier, well, I straightened up first. We, we almost don't want to admit that we're under any sort of influence, even though it's completely normal, completely human, and we're yeah. doing it to other people deliberately. We don't want it done to us. Yeah, ego is the enemy. Yeah. Um, uh, another persuasion uh, important element is that if your ego is making your decisions, they're just all going to be bad. Right? <laughs> so the more you can, you can tell yourself that ego is just a problem and not a thing to protect. You know, I see it as a defect. Like any type ego crawls in. Um, when I don't want it, it's a defect. But I also think it's a tool because I, I sometimes will amp up my ego um, because it makes my, my physio physio physiology yes. change. Um, when you act confident, you know, this is basic persuasion. If you, if you stand up straight, if you do the, the, victory, oh, yeah. the, vic old. the victory pose, um, that your, your body immediately um, changes to, to match what you're doing physically and what your mental state is. So you can, you can change your health, your performance, and everything else by manipulating your ego. But if you start thinking your ego is sort of important and you, know, you, should, you should bow to it, like if it's embarrassed about something, you shouldn't do that thing, that's, you know, if I'm embarrassed by something, I do that thing. <laughs> sure, that's the idea. That's uh, how you grow, right? Yeah. I, I think somewhere along the line, and I want to say probably somewhere in puberty, at least for me and for guys in general, 
we go from our ego being something that's used to protect us to us protecting our ego, and yeah. everything that happens after that is a freaking disaster. Yeah. Right. An absolute disaster. Yeah, you can actually look at people who are successful, and I think the people who can manage their ego the best almost always do better. You find that because then it becomes a non-consideration when they're trying to get somebody else, for example, in a persuasion context, if you're trying to get somebody else to do something and you have a choice between doing exactly what needs to get done in order for them to do that, or you have to somehow damage your ego, you often end up fighting against yourself and you do the wrong things, which is unfortunately why sociopaths are so good at what they do in many ways because they're completely unafraid to just ignore everything beneficial and negative about their own ego if it's going to get a desired result. And then after that, they'll get their ego back tenfold by essentially getting one over on their victim. Right. And we find that those people are highly effective in part because they are able to just separate their themselves from that ego for just long enough to manipulate the heck out of somebody in a very dastardly way often enough and get it done. That, that's why uh, accusations of narcissism, uh, again, whether it's Trump or, or me or anybody else, are somewhat missing the point that there is a positive amount of narcissism, you know, a healthy, good feeling about yourself, that just makes you more effective. And then there's too much that just makes you a jerk who can't see the world clearly. Um, but it, but if, if you know the difference between those two states, it's pretty useful to be a little bit narcissistic. Oh, just enough. Just narcissistic enough. That might be the title of this episode. <laughs> so what are you working on now? Well, I'm writing a book. Um, it's going to be called uh, Win Bigly. Uh, <laughs> okay. And uh, you can imagine what that's about. But it's about mostly about persuasion, but the, the context is the, the election. Uh, I also have a startup called the Wen Hub and uh, we can tell stories with time. So it's a, it's a platform for telling any kind of story about things that happened in the past or schedules of the future in a visual way. Again, it's visual persuasion. Uh, so instead of a texty little calendar, you can have you know, video and pictures and, and graphs and maps and stuff. And we will link to all that, of course, in the show notes as well as your book. I wanted to ask about the, there's a concept that you have on your blog that's about checking with your body for creative ideas, and I thought that was interesting. I never heard right. that before. So I like to think of creativity not so much as a process of creating something like out of nothing. If you think of it that way, it's just hard to do. I think of it as more of a, a fast iteration process where I clear my mind, and you can't really sit around with nothing in your head. If, if you get rid of the thought that's in there, if you flush it, and that's the hard part, a new one just fills it in. So I try to do that as quickly as possible. You know, boop, 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 you know, one idea and up, and then just flush, 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 until one moves me physically. So I'm using my body as a sensor. You know, so if I have an idea and I laugh, well, that's my comic for the day. But if I cycle through ideas, I go, interesting, interesting, sounds like a joke, sounds like a joke, <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. Right? So you're always looking, the only thing that matters, the, the uh, the X factor of any kind of creative effort, any kind of art, any kind of product, is that little thing that just makes you go, ah, you know, like you feel it. I was just opening up a new uh, Apple device, bought a new Apple computer, and just the process and the, the thought that they put into that of, you know, the tabs that, that just make a great sound and it's a, it feels right, it looks right. It's satisfying it's, at a visceral it, level, isn't it? it? Yeah, it is a, it's just almost a sensual experience. And I, I wanted somebody to be there because I kept looking around and go, oh, oh, look at this, oh, and it's better than the product itself. That's the funny thing. In many ways, it depends on the product, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so the you don't have anything if you haven't moved somebody's body, right? And I also use that as a way to know if your product or your idea has any value. So if some if you ask your friends, hey, what about my new idea, my product, or whatever? And they say, that's really good, that's great, you should do something with that, that's, that's terrific. You got nothing. That is zero. But if you say, what do you think of my product? And they say, hand me that. And play with it. Oh, do you mind if I borrow, is this the prototype? Can I take this? I, I got to show this to a friend. I got to show this to a friend. That's a physical action. Right, that's almost a guarantee that you have the X factor going there. So you look for the physical change, ignore the words. Are there anything that you, any drills or exercises that you do to make yourself in a more receptive place, especially when you're thinking, what Dilbert comic am I going to draw today? Sometimes you might just not be in the mood to laugh. Maybe your oatmeal's yeah. not sitting right. 
How yeah. do you get yourself in a receptive mode? Well, there, there's a lot of tricks, but I'll give you the, the big ones. The, the big one for a writer especially is the time of day. There's a time of day when your body, and people are a little bit different, but most writers either work early in the morning or late at night, which is really the same zone. Um, creativity just works better then. I, I don't know why. It's just something about your body rhythms or something. So the first thing is make sure you carve out that time. That, that's the big thing. And other artists say the same thing, so this is probably a pretty good generic rule, that you need to fill yourself up with unrelated thoughts, uh, maybe in the same field, but not necessarily related to what you're going to write, and then you have to get rid of it. So you've got to fill it up and get rid of it. Because most ideas are combinations of things uh, that don't fit together. Right? So I recently wrote a comic. Uh, I don't know if it'll be out uh, next few weeks, I guess, uh, in which uh, my character, Alice, uh, decides to date not a robot, but a, a drone, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, that's the sort of thing that's a combination of two ideas that came you know, from one field and another. And so you have to fill yourself with lots of just ideas so that some of them just accidentally bump together and you say, oh yeah, that reminds me of these two things. You put these together. And you got something. I think James Altucher calls that idea sex. I don't know if you've heard that comment or that uh, descriptor before. It's a little graphic. Oh, idea sex, where you're uh, you're bringing them in and releasing them. Is that what he's speaking? I, I guess you're bringing them all together, and then they just do whatever they do oh, in they their connect. conscious uh, subconscious oh, okay. mind, and they connect, and then something else comes out of it. Sometimes. Okay, I will. <laughs> I will accept that. Enjoy that visual. That deeply visual yes. persuasion. Yes. There you go. Uh, I meant to ask you this before, actually, before we wrap up on this one. When we were talking about persuasion before, and visual persuasion being one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful kind, do you find an advantage, since you're a talented and established artist, do you find that you're better at that in some ways, or is that something that even somebody who can't draw stick figures like me can take advantage of? Well, the first place um, I heard about this was just in ordinary corporate training, learning how to do presentations in a corporate structure, you know, picture, picture, picture. So this is sort of well-known stuff that it just isn't used as much as it should be. So people will remember to put it in a presentation, but when they're just talking, it's easy not to do it, right? So I guess the only thing that that's different about people who are trained is that they bring it into all their conversations and, and try to paint pictures. Yes, I think visually, and probably because I'm a cartoonist, I have a little bit more uh, I don't know, either training or natural ability in that, some combination of the two probably. So it comes somewhat naturally to me, but it is a, a result of training also. You mentioned some pretty creative stuff in your book and on your blog. On Becoming Great, you mentioned that every skill you acquire doubles your odds of success. Of course, we're generalizing the percentages here, but tell us what you mean by this. What is this skill stacking yeah. concept? I'll give you the quick version and then the long version is in my book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. Um, the idea is that um, you have some natural talents, most people do, something they're just you know, born with, and if you can add on top of those things, uh, skills that make sense and just keep adding, you can become unique. And the market uh, rewards <coughs> uniqueness. So it's not, it's not good enough that you're just really good at one thing, because there are probably a lot of people who are really good at that one thing. But if you're really good at one thing, and you know public speaking, you're probably going to be the boss of those people who are only good at one thing. But if you can also learn persuasion, and you're also good at communicating and writing, and these are all learnable things, at least within, let's say, the business realm. Everybody can learn this stuff. And you just keep going until uh, you have uniqueness that the market um, likes. Now, here's some examples. If you look at my career, I'm not a good artist. You know, I don't draw that well. Um, yeah, I'm in the maybe top 20%. Uh, I never took a writing class in college, um, but I can put words together. I do it pretty well. I'm not the funniest person in the room, even if I have a party in my own house. You know, I'm like third, third funniest in my <laughs> own house, right? Um, and I, I'm not a great business person, but I need business skills to run my cartoon mini empire and, and to have a content to write about. Uh, so I have this weird you know, bunch of skills that I intentionally developed because they work well together. And then on top of that, Dilbert came around when I was working on, uh, uh, in a technology lab at the phone company when the internet was new. And so this was a new skill, and I said, hey, this could be on the internet. This was before anybody even heard the word internet. So Dilbert was actually the first uh, syndicated comic on the internet. 
And that was because I had that extra skill. And that difference was probably the biggest difference in the success of Dilbert, is being on early on the internet where technology people cared. So always look for the, the skills you've got, and then what could you add to that that makes you special, that, that fits together well. So rather than trying to be the top 1% at drawing, you can say, look, I'm fine being in the top 20%. I don't have to spend the 30 years getting to that top 1% so that I can finally peak in my career. You mix top 20% drawing with top 20% business with top 20% being able to speak about what you're doing with top 20% humor or maybe top 30% if you're at one of your house parties. <laughs> then you end up with a unique enough mix where you're in the top 0.1% for people with that mix of skills in that particular area doing that particular thing. And by the way, that is one of the reasons that I saw Donald Trump as probable winner a year before. Not just persuasion reasons, but he has a talent stack that's insane. I mean, it's everything from you know, business to negotiating to he's got a good sense of humor. He's, he can do quick little tweets. It's hard to write something witty and, and, and quotable in 140 characters, but he does it regularly. Um, you know, you can see him give a speech and you say, well, that's really good. He's not the best speaker in the world, but he's got all these skills that are top 10%, top 20%. How smart is he? Probably top 10%, maybe higher, I don't know. But you put all that together, it's extraordinarily powerful, uh, just the, the talent stack you put together. How do we find what skills we should be developing if right now we're going, crap, I'm only good at computers, I'm only good at coding, I'm only good at humor, I'm only good at drawing. Uh, or I'm not good at any of that stuff and I just want to pick a few and get good at those. How do you start to identify where we should even be putting the work? Well, I would say there's some that are they're so universal you could just always do those and it would always work. So I'd say learning persuasion is going to go with everything. Learning to communicate better, everything. Uh, public speaking, that's sort of the, you know, I would say that's the, the king of a lot of the skills, right? Um, and then if you're in a technology area, you know, if you can code, you probably want to do interface and, you know, interface design and maybe a little graphic arts and learn how to use a little Photoshop. Usually people know which skills. You usually know if you're in an area which, which way to expand. So every time we add a skill, we're essentially shaving down the requirement of being that much better in all of the other skill areas that we have. I, I like to put it the other way, which is you're more unique. And, and the market is going to say, well, there's only one of them. And if I need somebody who can do these three things, there just aren't many people who can do those particular three things. Right. So if we want somebody who's a great public speaker, that's great. But if we want somebody who's going to be great at business and is able to communicate that to other people, now we need those two skills together. And if we want them to do it in an Asian environment where we're talking with our Chinese colleagues, well, if they speak Mandarin, they can be maybe a little bit uh, shaky on some of the other areas and get trained up, but hey, look, we're, we're looking for somebody who fits into this box, yeah. and you've got a foot in each one. Yeah, the second language is, should be on the short list of something everybody should do. What do you speak? English and? I, I did not learn early enough, but um, also I you know, grew up in upstate New York where there was absolutely no use for another language, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't see the need. If I'd grown up in California, obviously I would be speaking Spanish. Yeah, or Mandarin now. Or Mandarin. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you.